Have you ever wondered with all the nice things about Jamaica, why is Jamaica considered one of the deadliest countries in the world? What do you have to say for yourself? What's for dinner? What's going on here? What's that stink? What's this for? What time is it? What's that? Elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> Hey my beautiful people, welcome back to my channel Watson's World. If this is your first time visiting the channel, click on the subscription button and the notification bell so that you will be alerted every time I upload a new video. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at The Noble Cop. People, let us get this channel to 50,000 subscribers by the middle of August. Please also like and share my videos. Now, in this video, I will be exploring how Jamaica came to be one of the deadliest countries in the world. Yes, the beautiful little Caribbean island nation which is known for its lush landscape of mountains, rainforest and beautiful white sandy beaches. We're also home of the world's fastest people. I'm talking about likes like Shelley and Fraser Price and Usain Bolt. As a matter of fact, the USA and China are the only two other countries with more Olympic medals than Jamaica. Jamaica is also the undeniable authority for reggae music and produce such stars as Bob Marley. One love, one heart, let's get together and feel all right oh no don't know the thing said we are also the home of many grammy winning artists yeah man man like beanie man yeah the girls them sugar and coffee yes right now she have boomed down the place coffee is a young young artist just bust the other day and she get the grammy already now two quick facts about jamaica people jamaica produces the most music per capita the music in our blood it in our bone that is why you have so much people at jamaica want on artists we can't help it music is our lifeline and the second thing guys is that jamaica has the most churches per square miles yeah man, Jamaican people love God, very spiritual. Sometimes you have to wonder how Jamaica stays so with so many churches. Now I could go on and on about how wonderful Jamaica is. But this video is not about that. Have you ever wondered with all the nice things about Jamaica, why is Jamaica considered one of the deadliest countries in the world? Well the first fact guys is that Jamaica has hundreds of gangs. And more than 80% of Jamaica's homicides, murders, are committed with a firearm. Also, may I just add that close to 80% of Jamaica's murders are committed by gangs. Violent crimes including murder and sexual assault is a serious problem throughout Jamaica, particularly in Kingston and Pontica Bay. Now Jamaica has a nation of 2.8 million people and we have never seen the murder rate below 1000 persons per year in the last 20 years. In 2018 we saw a total of 1287 murders that was 47 persons out of every 100,000 residents and in 2019 we saw that the murder rate went up by 3.4 percent with a total number of murders of 1332 for that year. This is three times higher than the average for Latin American and the Caribbean countries. Uh, Forbes magazine listed Jamaica as the third most dangerous place for women travelers in 2017. And rightly so, we have seen so many women going missing in Jamaica. We have also seen children going missing. It's definitely a very sad state of affair. Now for comparison, let us look at a city like Toronto in Canada where the population is the same or very similar to the population of Jamaica. They experienced 96 homicides for the year 2018 and 78 homicides for the year 2019 and they considered this to be very high compared to Jamaica having over a thousand murders. In 2018, Business Insider ranked Jamaica 10th among 20 of the most dangerous places in the world. The International Monetary Fund recently cited crime as the number one impediment to Jamaica's economic growth. 
the Jamaican government concluded that corruption and the transnational crime it facilitates presents a grave threat to national security. However, the question is, how did Jamaica get here? Well, in order to understand how crime and violence has become embedded in this beautiful little island the way that it has, we need to take a look at the political history. Decades before the country's independence from Britain in 1962, supporters from the Jamaica Labour Party and the People's National Party were stoning, beating and stabbing one another for control over the island. They created rival gangs that evolved into organized criminal network and violence escalated over the decades as semi-automatic firearms replaced sticks and other rudimentary weapons. Turbulent political relations following independence led to the creation of garrison communities. Well, what are garrison communities? These are neighborhoods controlled by agents of political party and they persist to this day as crime strongholds. What used to happen also is that elections were typically accompanied by increased bloodshed and many key political figures were often openly associated with figures from the underworld. These were persons who established themselves as dons in the communities and took control of people. They actually run organized criminal networks that worked with the politicians. No, with crime lords and politicians, arms in arms, it's not hard to guess the pervasive influence of organized crime gang activities in Jamaica. Uh, narcotics are the main commodity and Jamaica serves as a major transshipment point to the large consumer markets of the North America and Europe. Several years ago, Jamaica's Minister of National Security claimed that one-fifth of America's demand for cocaine was satisfied by product flowing through Jamaica. Extortion and protection rackets are also big business in Jamaica. More recently, we see where lottery scamming was a big business in Montego Bay. Now, why have I mentioned all of these things? Well, obviously, drug smuggling extortion and protection rackets and also lottery scamming are all used to fuel gang activities in jamaica gangs use the proceeds from these criminal activities to further their criminal agenda and finance the gang by buying guns right and buying all the resources that they need to terrorize jamaicans the persistence of crime and violence in jamaica has undoubtedly become a cultural one so much so that it is being defended and promoted in dancehall music culture with many dancehall artists allegedly being linked to gangs, guns and violence. Now you may be asking what about law enforcement that is mandated to make sure that these persons are effectively prosecuted? What about the institutions which are charged with keeping violence in check? Well, with politicians and criminals all too often seen as intimately linked, many Jamaicans place little faith in the government. Police, meanwhile, are sometimes accused of partnering with leading crime dons to increase their influence in particular communities. In effect, tolerating certain criminal activities and outsourcing community policing to criminals. We have also seen where the JCF is widely accused of brutality. The police is also accused of carrying out many extrajudiciary killing. The human rights organization Amnesty International has alleged summary executions and unlawful detentions for years and police shootings are statistically significant cause of injury. All this means that many Jamaicans have an uneasy relationship with the people charged with protecting them. But one of the things that many of us have not seen is that police too suffer as large numbers of police officers are killed and their families are also targeted. I have personally seen where many police officers who are serious about carrying out their duty as law enforcement who have targeted criminals have been contacted by politicians to stand down and leave those criminals alone to step aside and if they don't then they will either lose the work or they'll be transferred to another division this is something that happens on a regular basis and so the police themselves are crippled by these politicians one report published in 2000 noted that constables were so fearful in certain neighborhoods that they conducted their patrols in haste 
avoiding engagement with the local community that might otherwise build a more constructive relationship. If police officers are viewed as part of the problem, they have also been viewed as ineffective in solving it. Some Jamaicans see the JCF and the JDF as a legal gang established by the government to do their biddings. Now obviously this is a serious problem people. We have seen these things taking place over and over and over again. We have seen where politicians are responsible for the establishing of gangs and criminal networks. And now that it is out of hand, what the system is doing is using the same brute force to fight criminality. Something that they have always used. When a gang gets out of control, when a Dan gets out of control, how do you subdue that Dan or that gang is by taking them out. This is an approach that we see up to today with the state of emergency that is being established. It's the same approach. Is this solving the problem or is this creating a cycle? And if this cycle continues, what we will be doing is strengthening the crime monster. Criminals will get smarter. They will find new creative and innovative ways of carrying out their criminal activities. They will get more advanced than the security forces because while the security forces are busy taking out these gangsters, then you have the younger generation that is planning on how they can carry out their criminal activities in a more inconspicuous way. So how are we going to solve this problem in Jamaica? A problem that has been created by politicians. A problem that has been created by people who the Jamaican people put them trust in. Well, first of all, the politicians have to show that they are interested in changing. They have to create a system of transparency. They need to create a system where no one is above the law. They have to create a system where politicians are held accountable and if they are found to be involved in criminal activities, if they are found to align with gangs, then they must pay the ultimate price. They must face the justice system just like anyone else. Now, in order for us to create that transparency, we the people of Jamaica need to take control by holding them accountable. We will not stand for the foolishness anymore. One of the things that I've often noticed with many politicians in Jamaica is that they will not own up to the atrocities that they contribute to in the country. They will not own up to the fact that many of their colleagues are associated with gangs and criminal activities. And until we can have politicians being honest and coming forward and stating the problem, then we will continue this cycle. I have seen lately where the Prime Minister and the opposition leader, Mr. Phillips, they have signed some kind of agreement that they would be fighting corruption in all facets. But then it's more than that. Finding a solution to the problem is more than them just coming out to say that we have vowed to fight corruption. We want to see action. We have seen many corrupt activities in the government there in Jamaica and we need to have a zero tolerance approach to corruption, not only among police officers but among government officials. This is a little bit I did to kind of have an understanding of where we're coming from because how are we going to get where we want to be if we don't understand where we are coming from and what the problem was in the past, right? And what it is now and how we are going to resolve that problem going forward. People, I can tell you the problem is more than an economic one. It is It is not because the youths them not have no money or the youths them don't have a job. It is because crime and violence is a culture in Jamaica. It's, it has become a cultural problem and we have to eliminate that culture. That is why I've always said that we need social development program. We need to get into the schools and educate our children. We need to develop a, a curriculum that promotes a culture of lawfulness. We need to uh, speak to our children about crime and violence and the immorality and criminality of getting involved with certain things. We have to turn our children's minds from gangs and guns. We have to make sure that we put programs in place in schools 
to do that can we save those who are already in gangs yes we can but we have to be serious about putting in um, necessary programs so when the police them go they go scrape up man off of the streets listen don't just scrape them up off of the streets lock them up and then you know let them go have workshop with them man we not detain the youths them for seven days under the state of emergency. We not do with the youths them for that seven days. Think, people. Think. We not can have workshops with the youth them. Have workshops with them, man. Set up some programs to them and have some people come in and talk to them and try to show them a better way and show them a better future. That is what I say. Anyway, people, just wanted to do this quick little video for you. As per usual, you know, you know, don't know. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at the noble cop don't leave this video without subscribing all right until next time peace out yeah man